Welcome to the Central Television. I am Dikon Onopan. Enjoy the top stories at this hour. Court bars PDP National Exco's Board of Trustees from sacking Damagum as acting national chairman. UK government slaps visa ban on Nelson Mandela's grandson. Kenya's president pledges to deploy additional 600 officers to support UN-backed mission in Haiti. Details to come your way shortly. We begin by telling you that the crisis within the People's Democratic Party intensified on Friday as the Integrity Faction announced the appointment of Yayari Ahmed Mohammed as the new acting national chairman. Earlier on Friday, the PDP's National Working Committee, led by acting national chairman Umar Damagum, suspended National Legal Advisor Kamal Dean Ajibade CN and the National Publicity Secretary Debo Ulugwangba accusing them of anti-party activities. In a swift turn of events, another faction within the NWC, in a statement issued by Ulugwada, announced the suspension of Damagum and the National Secretary Sam Anyang for similar reasons. Ulugwada, speaking on behalf of the Integrity Group, stated that Mohammed's appointment as acting national chairman is effective immediately, in line with the PDP's amended constitution of 2017. In the meantime, the Federal High Court in Abuja has issued an order preventing the National Executive Committee and the Board of Trustees of the People's Democratic Party from re removing Umar Damagum as the acting national chairman of the party. Justice Peter Lifu ruled that only Damagum should be recognized as the party's national chairman until the PDP's national convention scheduled for December 2025. This ruling came in response to a suit filed by Senator Omar al Nina. The judge emphasized that, according to Articles 42, 47 and 67 of the PDP Constitution, national officers can only be elected at the party's national convention. He added that all party members are required to adhere to the Constitution in their actions. So to give more insight on the PDP leadership crisis, we are joined by Acting National Legal Advisor of the PDP, Osoha Okechuku. Uh, Mr. Okechuku, good afternoon to you. It's nice to have you around. Mr. Okechuku, can you hear me? Uh, hello, Mr. Okechuku. Uh, well, I'm guessing uh, Mr. Okechuku can actually hear me or there's an issue from his end, something that we are going to Hello? rectify uh, in no time. Well, okay, so uh, if you can hear me, Mr. Okechuku, let's just be sure. Hello? I'd like you to say something and uh, go ahead and let us, let us understand the fact that we see um, different factions um, accusing each other of anti-party activities. What is actually going on uh, within the party in terms of the leadership structure? There are no relief, okay. there are no uh, serious crisis. But what actually happened in the party is that uh, the National Working Committee, which is the organ shadow with the day to day running of the party, you know, met in their meeting yesterday. So when they were in the meeting, they came up with a decision. Of the party. One of that decisions is that met in their meeting yesterday. So when they were in the meeting, they came up with a decision. One of that decision is that uh, the uh, national uh, publicity secretary of the party and the national legal advisor of the party that they should step aside based on the allegation leveled against them that they, uh, you know there was misconduct and they, some uh, anti-party, you know, that they behaved in a manner that was not uh, comfortable with the. Uh, the, the office they occupy it. So the NWC reached a decision 
that they should step aside you know, for a proper investigation to be to, uh, taken in the, in the matter, which they constituted the committee uh, to look into that matter. And that committee is headed by His Excellency uh, Arapaja. You know, so he was, and uh, other members of the committee was to investigate that allegation and come up with a report. So he, after that, they now asked that, that in accordance with the provision of the constitution that the deputies, that's the deputy national legal advisor and the deputy national publicity secretary to step in, into the offices as acting uh, capacity. So based on that, uh, myself, who is, the de who, was the, who is the deputy national legal advisor, I now step into the office of the national legal advisor as act in acting capacity pending the termination of that uh, investigative uh, uh, panel that has been constituted. So that is what is on board, and that is what is on the ground. It's, it's, it's just a, a, a process and a procedure of running the party and then the administration of the party. That's what I'll tell you. Uh, okay, so aside that, we also hear that um, some members of the party are vested in the interest that the uh, national chairmanship of the party um, should be rotated between the north and the south, uh, the, the southern regions, and not through any other procedure not enshrined in the PDP's constitution. So is that also part of the contention within the party members? You stated what well, you said about the national chairman, the acting national chairman, the position of the acting national chairman is not in doubt, it's a constitutional provision. So, when you the issue at stake is uh, concerning the 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 the, uh, the 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 office of that uh, national chairman in the uh, acting capacity, so and it is provided in our constitution when there was an issue in the past concerning a uh, when uh, Dr. Yochayu was the national chairman of the party. So there was an issue that came up, and he was asked to step aside uh, based on a court order. Uh, so when that issue came up, uh, up, he stepped aside. So when he vacated the office, by the constitution of our party, it is provided that in the absence of the national chairman, that is either per adventure, you know, either by resignation or death, or if he's no longer occupying the office, that the law, the law, the, the position of the law is that the, 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 the deputy from the same zone where the chairman comes from will step in and then in acting capacity. That's why uh, Ambassador Damagu, who is now the acting chairman, you know, came on board because he, he, was, he is the deputy national chairman, not. And that in accordance with the provision of the constitution, that the deputy from that zone should uh, take, uh, uh, step into his office. And he has been acting up to this point. And if you go to section 47 sub 6 of the constitution of the party, and even precisely section 35 sub subsection uh, 3 of the constitution, so he provided that when he can always, if he's acting in, uh, in that office, that he can, be he can only be removed if there is a national convention that elects a new chairman. And such thing has not taken place. There has not been any a convention since he started acting. And the law is so clear. He, he, the law did not state the duration of when he will stop acting, either for one month or for two months. He said he start acting pending the election of a new chairman by a convention. And such thing has not taken place. So even if today there is a court uh, ruling, a court judgment that, uh, we, we, that we received today concerning that, that, that position, whether he will leave office or not, that the court has stated in its wisdom that he will stay there in office as acting chairman pending uh, the next year, September, when there will be a, a convention between that September and the November next year. I believe that there must be a national convention to elect all the national officers of the party. So That's then why can't, why can't the NEC and the BOT wait for the party's national convention uh, to begin in December because they want him out, but then there's a constitutional provision for how these things should be done. So why is it that they are such in a haste and they don't want to follow due process? No, come again. Let me hear you well. So I said, why does it now look as though the neck 
and the BOT who wants Damagum out. You mean that there, there have not been a date for a convention? No, what I'm saying is that it seems as though the NEC and the BOT of the party, of the PDP, wants Damagum out now. And I'm asking why can't they wait till when the national convention will be held in December before they um, carry on with that process? Why are they in a haste and do not want to follow due process? I don't think uh, what you have said. I don't. I, I mean, I, I don't agree with you. I don't think the neck. The neck have not sat. They have not made any pronouncement. They have not made any statement concerning that either the resignation or or, or a, you know the Magu sitting office and even BOT. They have not said anything concerning that. What we are waiting like yesterday after the BOT meeting and also the National Working Committee meeting, a date has been fixed for. The next neck meeting, which is supposed to come up uh, on the twenty fourth of uh, this month, so it's only in that meeting. And uh, everything, like as I've stated and I've narrated to you, is a is a is a, is a something that has to do with the provision of the constitution. It's a legal matter. So BOT cannot say how the chairman can be removed or not. I told you that what is you know expressly uh, provided in the constitution is that. Before that act in acting capacity, before he can leave that office, it's only when a, a new another convention is, uh, you know, uh, 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 when you now do another convention, national convention, then where you now elect a new chairman. Then when that new chairman assumes office, then the acting chairman will uh, leave office. Of course, the, the world or the, the nature does not uh, uh, have uh, a pause vacuum. That's what I will tell you. So the BOT or even MEC cannot make any pronouncement because it's something that is constitutional, it's something that is you know has a Binding. legal legal provision. Mm. So we are expecting that by that twenty fourth of uh, of uh, uh, October, if there's going to be a NEC meeting, the NEC will look at whatever decisions the National Working Committee have taken concerning that uh, whatever they have said. And uh, like I told you, there's a court judgment right now because a matter was filed in the court to look into that this, what we are discussing now and the court came up with a ruling that we we, we are you know informed today that there is a judgment in court that has stated and said expressly that the Damagu will stay in office from now to at least september october next year when there will be going to be another convention that is what i'll tell you so neck or or board of trustees does not have that powers to even determine whoever is going to be the chairman at this point because okay. it's a constitutional issue. All right. Uh, so, uh, okay, Chuku, acting uh, national legal advisor for the P PDP. Thank you so much uh, for um, sharing your thoughts with us. We appreciate that. You are watching New Central Television, and of course, um, the news continues. When we go on a break and return, we'll tell you about the appeal court's judgment in terms of reaction. Even as we know that the River State government has insisted that Ame Wule and uh, 26 others uh, should not be reinstated. We'll bring you more details when we're back. Thanks for staying with us. I'll tell you that the River State, uh, uh, that is where we're actually going to, where the um, state government has reacted to the appeal court judgment on Thursday in Abuja on the state assembly crisis. The state government says the judgments did not reinstate the Martin Amewili led faction of the state house of assembly by any stretch of imagination. In a statement signed by the state attorney general and commissioner for justice, Israel Dagogo Iboroma, in Port Harcourt on Thursday. The government clarified that Ame Wili and 26 others had defected on December 11, 2023, adding that their seats became automatically vacant from the day they announced their defection from the People's Democratic Party to the All Progressives Congress to the All World. The Attorney General insisted that the issue of defection of Ame Wili and 26 others was never before the Federal High Court and the Court of Appeal in Abuja and therefore no court has legitimized their membership of the House of Assembly on the basis of defection. To discuss this, we are joined by a legal practitioner, Henry Ekinne. Uh, Mr. Ekinne, nice to have you around. Uh, it's my pleasure to join you this afternoon. Okay, now um, the River State Government is insisting that the seats of the defected lawmakers became automatically vacant from the day they announced their defection. So is that a valid position to resume based on the provision of the Constitution, uh, looking at subsection or section 109 uh, I and G of the 1999 Constitution as amended? 
Yes, to the extent that the constitution remains uh, what it's been, and then that provision of the constitution has not been altered, that's the uh, proper position, and that's the uh, proper submission with respect to the provision of the constitution in regards to uh, the effects of a uh, willful vacation of uh, the seat of the legislature in the House of Assembly, including the River State House of Assembly. So um, we've made this argument, and I think that's the constitutional one, that um, since the willful of uh, without prompting, uh, when the 27 former members of the Utah State House of Assembly um, left the political party that sponsored them, what they generally referred to as um, a defection, uh, and then declared that on the floor of the House in um, the legitimate proceedings of the House of the University House Assembly, automatically, by giving effect to the provision of the Constitution, they seek to uh, the members of the House of Assembly. And then to consolidate that, when the remaining members of the University House of Assembly at that time uh, convened and elected for themselves a speaker, a speaker of the University House of Assembly, then right on the book, Edith May here, uh, made the required declaration where the Constitution required a speaker of the House who declared those seats vacant and then communicate and make uh, um, calling for the conduct of the election to fill those positions within 19 days. And that, that has happened in River State, where um, right from the late May here, then Speaker declared those seats vacant, uh, communicated INEC. To the best of my knowledge, even at John Synodai, creating or giving opportunity for INEC to prepare and conduct those elections. Uh, to fill those constituencies, but uh, unfortunately, for whatever reason, I next didn't conduct those elections okay. until uh, Edith May here resigned as a member and resigned as a speaker. And then the remaining members for that uh, um, conducted election and who said another and that speaker. Uh, okay, that now is, uh, if right the law, uh, Mr. Kenya, if the law is the law, now why has this issue been given several interpretations for a, a couple of months now? And why is it seeing different judicial verdicts being handed down? Because it seems as though there are probably state actors, maybe non-state actors, that are trying to subvert the position of, of the law. I think that's something I'm afraid I would need to uh, state here. It does appear to me, to the best of my knowledge, that no court has frontally, uh, with determination, taken this particular matter of defection and then um, given the pronouncement as, as provided by the Constitution and then even authorities uh, that are valuable to take a decision to that effect. What has happened in uh, a number of the cases that have been decided has always been touching the plants where I, 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 I just mentioned this a few days ago that what has happened in uh, a number of the matters that have yet to be decided is that the courts will be looking at issues around this matter, around these plants, and then it, it's rather uh, those who feel as beneficiaries of those decisions that will give interpretation and, if you like, say, there is an implication. It implies this. It implies that when there has actually not been a clear pronouncement with respect to a definite pronouncement of court, where a member of the legislative house defects in the manner that the 27 former members defected in River State, what the consequence is, uh, clearly, by the provision of the Constitution and decision of the Supreme Court. But what has happened, just as uh, we, 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 uh, we would say, maybe when we go further in this discussion, just a motor short uh, decision of the High Court, sometimes on the Supreme Court, what is the matter particularly for the determination of the effect of that defection? I can tell you clearly the parties to that suit of just a motor short that led to even the decision of the appeal yesterday, the appeal court yesterday, it wasn't a matter for defection and then the effect of the defection of the University House Assembly members. That okay. the plaintiffs in that suit before just a motor show were actually the University House Assembly and uh, Martin Amibli. Then the defendants were largely National Assembly. Hmm. It wasn't clearly a matter for the defection and then the effect of that defection. So you could see where Martin Amibli sued the National Assembly of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, the Senate President, the Majority Leader, the Minority Leader of the Senate, and then the Speaker of the House of Representatives, the Deputy Speaker, the Majority Leader of House of Reps, the Minority Leader of House of Reps, and the Clerk of the National Assembly, and then brought in the Governor of River State, the River State Civil Service Commission, mm. the um, um, Ed Senate here. The, the cost of the matter then, in the originating summons, was when they feared 
that the National Assembly was going to take over the proceedings of the River Tayapa Assembly, okay. that the governor was going to call the National Assembly to take over the proceedings. Okay. So that was the cause of that suit. Uh, okay, and so... By, by... Okay, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, so we, we know the rankings when we talk about the, the state courts, um, the federal high courts, um, the Supreme Court, the appeal courts, but within the context of this uh, conversation, uh, can the perceived obstinacy on the part of the River State government uh, be seen as being in contempt uh, of courts? Because a ruling has been handed down, but the River State is insisting that the Army Willie faction cannot be recognized or reinstated. No, there can't be contempt. If, if, if I heard you clearly, and I have read the press release by the Honorable Attorney General of, uh, of River State, the, the Attorney General clearly stated that look, the, the judgment of, uh, of Justice Motoshaw, now upheld by the Court of Appeal, isn't quite a declaration as for the status of Martin Abewle. So the government making that pronouncement, I do not think as uh, uh, contemptuous, really. And I'm not sure that the River State government is even. Um, conducting itself in disobedience to the order of court. Recall that when Justice Motoshaw delivers his judgment, the government of River State, the governor of River State, appeals, is satisfied of that judgment, appeal to the Court of Appeal. So even right now that the Court of Appeal has delivered judgment yesterday, I understand that the government has instructed the lawyer to appeal to the Supreme Court. So when you file an appeal, it is not a, a disobedience. Mm. I've also said, when you also even file um, an application for state of execution, those are legal means of suspending the execution or enforcement of a judgment of court. It's not an outright disobedience to doing the opposite uh, as, mm. as against uh, the decision of the court. Okay. So I'm not sure that the issue of content has actually arisen here. But at all, assuming there's even any content, who is the contender here is the governor of River State. What will be the effect of contempt of a governor? Also considering the provision of the constitution with respect to immunity okay. of a governor. Because contempt is, is, is a criminal conduct. Mm. Can a governor of the state who is covered by immunity be charged and proceeded for contempt? I'm, I'm afraid is no. All right, all right. Uh, Eric, Ine, thank you so much for uh, bringing your perspective to this to help us understand it better. It was nice talking to you. We move on now. And thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be on your platform. We move on now. The federal government has granted uh, petroleum marketers the authorization to lift petrol directly from the Dangote refinery by bypassing the Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited. This update was provided by the Minister of Finance, Wale Edun, who also serves as the chairman of the Naira Crude Seal Implementation Committee. Edwin explained that this new arrangement allows marketers to negotiate directly with the refinery, which is expected to foster a more competitive market and streamline the supply of petroleum products. He also expressed confidence that these measures would improve market conditions, ultimately benefiting all Nigerians in the long run. In the meantime, the Independent Petroleum Marketers Association of Nigeria has resolved its disputes with the Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited. Following a meeting with the director of the Department of State Services, Adiola Jai, this was disclosed by the National PRO and spokesperson for Ipman, Chinedu Ukadike, in an interview with News Central Television. The dispute arose due uh, to the high cost of premium motor spirits sold to Ipman members by NNPCL. Previously, Ipman had threatened to halt operations nationwide. However, with the resolution, Dangote will now supply independent marketers through Ipman. The association has agreed to await the implementation of the signed resolutions, thereby averting a potential strike. Yesterday, that then uh, we, 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 we reached a, a conclusion and some measures are going to take place. He has also resolved that Dangote is going to sell to us independent marketers. He has also resolved that NMPCL will load us out all our, 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 our tickets that is uh, in, our, in their system so that we can be able to buy from anywhere we want to also buy. He also went out for that to, to resolve the issue of our money that has been hanging in the petroleum exploitation fund. And uh, the, the uh, head of uh, NNDPR graciously 
I approved some of uh, 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 10 billion naira to be able to pay the standing, uh, standing. These are the things that have been lingering for a very period of time. And All right. The director of uh, within, within just three hours, reserve most of this. So we're no longer going on strike. But we are watching for the implementation of all that we have agreed upon. Away from that, to improve policy making, infrastructure development, and transformation in Nigeria and Africa, the Nigerian Economic Summit Group is emphasizing the significance of stakeholder participation. The theme of the 30th Nigerian Economic Summit and collaboration uh, is collaborative action for growth, competitiveness, and stability, which aims to encourage stakeholder engagement. The theme will encourage dialogue among key stakeholders to explore cooperative opportunities for growth, competitiveness, and stability. The summit seeks to showcase Nigeria's leadership in driving the continent's transformation and to create opportunities for both present and future generations. Now, 42 African countries, including Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso, have indicated interest to participate in the All-African Military Games coming up between November 18 and 30 this year. The Chief of Defense Staff and Company of the Minister of the Federal Capital Territory said the Games, which is expecting about 3,000 officials and athletes from sister African nations competing for 19 sporting events, has tremendous economic prospects for the nation. Amadin Ui tells us more. It was a World Press briefing informing citizens about the upcoming All Africa Games being hosted by Nigeria. As Chief of Defense Staff, I'm pleased to announce that Nigeria will host the African Military Games, a prestigious event that brings together military personnel from across the African continent to compete in various sporting disciplines. This event, which is scheduled to hold from the 18th to 30th November 2024, presents a unique opportunity for our armed forces to showcase their skills, foster camaraderie amongst participants, and strengthen military cooperation and partnership. It is also another means of our non kinetic operations. The Defense Headquarters says that preparations are in top gear to ensure that their games are a success. They also add that it will enhance collaboration among African militaries. Already we received 42 African countries showing their interest to participate in Africa, in, in Abuja. And by today, we receive all about, about 27 final entry of uh, our members that are coming to Abuja. And what is more interesting in this event is all the Nigerian neighbors are participating in this championship. We have Niger is coming. We have just received the entry, entry list from the Niger Republic. We are receiving entry. We have received entry from Mali, from Burkina Faso, from the Benin Republic. Chad and Cameroon. The theme for these games is enhancing military cooperation in Africa through sports. And uh, the main objective is to foster the already established relationship among militaries in Africa and also to enhance our readiness and cooperation in order for us to, you know, not to go to work, but for us to enjoy playing together in, this, in, the, in the field of sport for, you know, further uh, improving our military cooperation among African nations. The FCT minister, acting as the chief host, assured the military that the FCT administration will support efforts aimed at ensuring their games are a success. On the, the part of FCT, be sure that we are going to give all the necessary support and make sure that security is tight in the FCT. We're already working on that with all sister security uh, agencies to last with the local organizing uh, committee that will have a huge free uh, okay, location. About 1,725 officials and athletes have registered for the Games, with 3,000 officials and athletes expected in total. 19 sporting events, including combat sports and others, will be contested during the Games. In Abuja for News Central, I am Amadine Uyi.
You're watching New Central now. We're going to break and return. When we return, we'll be telling you about the failed portions of Asaba on the Shah Expressway, even as the Deputy Governor of the State has welcomed the start of the media works. To stay with us. Nice to know you're there. The Deputy Governor of Delta State, Monde Onyeme, has expressed hope that the nightmare faced by motorists plying the Benin on the Shah Expressway would soon be over with the commencement of remedial works on the field portion of the road at Asaba Onisha Axis. Onyeme, who is serving as acting governor as the state governor is on leave, assured of the completion of sides of the dual carriageway to ease movement of vehicles pending the end of the rainy season. The deputy governor also disclosed that plans are underway to fix internal roads in Asaba failing as a result of motorists using them as diversion from the field federal roads. We asked the contractor some questions there. And he promised us that uh, within one week or thereabout, the first lane on this other side, you know, will be remedied then before they will move to the other uh, lane. Then, of, of course, after the rainy season, they will come and do the proper work. So we thank the federal government for their response because Remedying that portion of the road will reduce pressure on our own internal roads. So I must, I'm sure that uh, within the next few days or weeks at most, uh, these problems will be a thing of the past. Nigeria's federal government says that the 18-year age limit for entry into universities in the country, which has sparked nationwide controversies, eliciting diverse reactions in the last few months will not be affecting students participating in WIEC, NECO and NAPTEB examinations or any ordinary level examinations holding in the country. Nigeria's Minister of Education made this known during the 68th National Council on Education meeting holding in the nation's capital Abuja, saying that government intends to develop a guideline that will not deny exceptionally gifted and brilliant students any opportunity to get into universities in the country. It was clarified many times. I said, look, we are only drawing attention to what is in the acts. You know, uh, it be those acts that I mentioned earlier on, but it doesn't, you know, apply to those who want to do NECO, WASC, and other all-level examination, basic all-level examination, you can do that if, if circumstances permit, if you are 15. But the only thing is that the admission for university will be 18. You know, all universities, all countries have a provision for uh, exceptional talents. So we are going to look at how we are going to harvest exceptional talents so that they can be uh, individually and separately provided. While Nigeria's federal government says it has entered a new partnership with Plan International to foster the advancement of youth development in the country, Nigeria's Minister of State for Youth Development made this known during a signing of a memorandum of understanding with international developmental partner Plan International. The minister says that the partnership is part of the federal government's efforts to address critical issues affecting young Nigerians, particularly young women and children. Our work with the Plan International will focus on five key areas, youth empowerment and leadership development, education and skill development, health and well-being introducing sexual and productive act to educate the young people, most especially the young female. Promotion from violence and other whole abuse, promotion gender equality and inclusion. These MOUs are not for play. These MOUs are serious commitments of the government and we don't take it for granted. In fact, we will not be able to do more if we don't have an MOU. But now we have an MOU, we will unlock all our reserves and the opportunities that are availed to us. Because then we are saying we are serious. The government has given us the endorsement. The government is saying, let us work together. And so we will unlock it 
and then we'll see what we can do for young people. Now, we'll tell you that the South African BDS coalition says it is appalled by the UK government's imposition of last minute visa restrictions on Mandela, Mantel Mandela, the grandson of Nelson Mandela, who was scheduled to embark on a Palestinian solidarity tour of Britain, condemning what they describe as the Israeli genocide. The South African BDS coalition claims Prime Minister Kerstama's government is giving into pressure from the pro Israel lobby and succumbing to a smear campaign by the British mainstream media against Mandela Mandela, a former ANC member of parliament and staunch Palestine solidarity activist. In the House of Commons, Stama refused to commit to halting the sale of weapons to Israel. And now the coordinator of the South African BDS coalition, Roshan Dadu, joins us from Johannesburg to discuss this further. Thank you so much, Dadu, for joining us. Thank you for inviting us onto the show. All right. So uh, what specific aspects of the visa ban do you find most concerning? Well, I think that there's been no reason given. There's been a whole lot of additional uh, complications that have uh, been presented completely out of the ordinary. And no proper decision has been given, although it now looks like the latest news we have is that he won't manage to make it at all for any of the dates of meetings he had. It was over the, this week and into next week um, in different towns across the United Kingdom. And I mean, you know, how the United Kingdom thinks it can uh, silence someone who carries the name of Mandela, who's the grandson, of course, of Nelson Mandela, who has been very vocal in support of the Palestinian struggle. If they think that they can bow to the, the nonsense that was being published in the mainstream media there that was trying to smear um, Mandela Mandela, trying to imply that his support for the international legal right of the Palestinian people to resist occupation and resist uh, settler colonialism and genocide, if they think that you know the government, a Labour Party government, can bow to that, it's really quite concerning indeed. Mm. So then what specific actions now is your group advocating for uh, in response to the visa ban? Well, we have been trying to take it up through both the African National Congress. As you said, uh, Mandela Mandela was until the last election an, a member of parliament for the African National Congress um, and through the government because we just feel it's really um, not, you know, not OK to, to be trying to uh, stop South African voices, particularly, of course, when M Nelson Mandela was called a terrorist by the British government at the time by Margaret Thatcher's government. And at the time, the Labour Party was a lot more supportive of the anti-apartheid movement in the case of our struggle. And we really feel that this kind of uh, censorship goes against any kind of uh, freedom of expression or human rights or any pretense of the Labour Party at international solidarity, which is what they had offered to us during our struggle. And hmm. uh, we know that the UK, just like the US, is the bastion of um, freedom of expression, a right that is actually granted under a democratic setting. So what message do you think this action sends about the UK's relations with South Africa and its commitments to human rights? Well, I mean, I think it's quite a slap in the face, given that South Africa has taken the case at the International Court of Justice against Israel under the Genocide Convention. And as we know, the court is going to start um, the full proceedings soon. The uh, memorial de uh, document will be presented before the end of this month by South Africa. And that court is taking the case because they indeed they agree there is a probable case of genocide. We've also seen the General Assembly vote where the majority of countries in the world voted last month to implement the already existing provisions um, given by the court of International Court of Justice and mm -hmm. basically move towards sanctions. And we know that was exactly the kind of pressure we called for from the international community to isolate apartheid South Africa in support of our struggle. So it really does seem as if the, uh, the British government is now 
not willing to even countenance hearing from an eminent South African voice such as Mandela Mandela in support of the Palestinian struggle, which okay. is indeed very concerning. Mm. Uh, pretty much, I must say. Uh, Roshan Dadu, um, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us. Thank you. You're welcome. Let's take you to East Africa, where Kenya's president, William Ruto, has pledged to send an additional 600 officers to support the UN-backed mission in Haiti. This commitment was made following a meeting with Haiti's prime minister, who is currently visiting Kenya. Both leaders have called on the international community to increase the support for the mission, which has been struggling due to a severe funding shortage. Ruto emphasized the urgency of global backing, stressing the need for immediate action to stabilize Haiti. The Prime Minister's visit comes just a week after a brutal gang attack in the town of Port Sunday, located around 100 kilometers from the capital, Port-au-Prince. The assault left 109 people dead and 40 others wounded. Africa will tell you that at least 11 people have died as Hurricane Milton unleashed tornadoes across Florida. According to officials, Florida is grappling with flooding, power outages and other woes from a storm that was milder than many had feared would be catastrophic. The hurricane tore through the state late on Wednesday before surging into the Atlantic, leaving behind roads blocked by fallen trees and power lines. It also ripped the roof off a baseball stadium. Approximately 3 million homes and businesses are without power. Local authorities said the fatalities include five in St. Lucie County, three in Volusia County, two in the city of St. Petersburg, and one in the city of Tampa. Thus far, it appears that tornadoes rather than floodwaters are responsible for the storm's death toll. by Chief International Correspondent Afia Hagen. Afia, it's nice to have you around. Now tell us more as regards the latest on the aftermath of the Hurricane Milton. Well, the latest death toll actually brings it up to 16. So 16 people that have died in the wake of Hurricane Milton. And you're absolutely right in saying that it was the tornadoes that really caused a lot of the damage. There was also a once in a thousand year rainfall event where 18 inches of rain fell on the city of St. Petersburg. At power outages and destructive winds mean that 2.5 million people are still without power. And there's thought to be between 30 and $50 billion of insured losses in the area of Florida. And that's just people who have insurance. People that have an insurance, haven't got insurance, means that that number could rise uh, into the hundreds of billions of dollars of the amount of damage that was done by Hurricane Milton. So can we expect more storms like this one, this uh, hurricane season? Well, the hurricane season lasts from the 1st of June to the 30th of November. And this year has been unusual in that the hurricane season has gotten off to a slow start. There have been 13 storms uh, already, sorry, 14 named storms already. Um, but this season, like I said, has got to a slow start, the slowest in 10 years. Now, of the 13 named storms, at nine became hurricanes and four major hurricanes. That's a category three of above. That's what we saw from Hurricane Milton and Hurricane Helene just before it. Now, because August was unusually quiet, it could mean that the rest of this hurricane season, the rest of October and into November, could see more storms. And climate change means that the seas are warmer and means that the storms are more vicious, much more violent, much more ferocious, and much bigger than we're used to seeing them. So much more rainfall within them, and then spawning these tornadoes like we've seen over the past few days. All right. Uh, finally, before um, I let you go, um, okay, but probably we should just end it there because of time constraints. But then, Afia Egan, thank you so much for um, sharing these updates with us. Thank you. And that's all at this hour, but before we go, we look at our top stories again. Court has barred PDP National Exco's Board of Trustees from sacking Damagum as acting national chairman.
UK government has slapped visa ban on Nelson Mandela's grandson. We also told you that Kenya's president has pledged to deploy additional 600 officers to support UN-backed mission in Haiti. You can watch New Central live on DSTV channel 422, Star Times, channel 274, Apple TV and YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I am Nikon on Obanjo. Thank you.